Money and banking should be something all of you know about, right? You all have money in your pocket, and you probably all have a bank account. So there's probably not much to say about the topic, but I'll try to <laughs> try to add a little bit to it anyway. Now, money doesn't uh, does not and cannot originate by order of the state. In other words, the United States government just couldn't print up little pieces of paper and put numbers on them and expect people to take it. It must originate in the processes of the free market. And before there was money, there was barter. Goods were produced by the people who were good at producing a particular good. So if you were extra good at, at producing something, then you would likely have a surplus of that and you would be able to trade your surplus for other goods that you needed. And if you had, if you were, say, uh, uh, if you had trees on your property and you're a good wood chopper, say, you might have surplus wa- firewood. But of course, a uh, man does not live by firewood alone. And, uh, but you find a, you find a lady down the road who has chickens. And, uh, most egg ladies, uh, end up with more eggs than they can eat. So the egg lady and the log guy make a deal. And they trade maybe one egg for one one uh, piece of firewood. And of course, this this works out fine. But we should all, always recognize as well that these um, exchanges can can um, can change. Say some of the chickens died. Now, if some of the chickens died, the egg lady'd have less eggs, and she wouldn't be as willing to part with say one of the eggs for one one piece of the firewood. She would likely want two pieces of firewood for every egg that she traded. Same way with the log guy. Say so there was a fire on his property, and uh, he didn't have as much wood, and he might require a couple of logs for um, for every egg that uh, that he would trade for. So these um, these uh, terms of this barter and this trade would would change depending on the supply and demand of these particular goods. But the big limitation to barter is the scope of trade. The log man has to find someone who both wants logs and someone who who has something that he wants. Same way with the egg lady. She has to find somebody who wants eggs, and that particular person has to have something that she wants. And this is called the double coincidence of wants. It's one of the big problems with with barter. Second problem is indivisibility. Now we can chop up these logs, make them smaller, and uh, and work with them fairly well. But eggs, well, they don't chop up very well, unless you wanted to scramble them and do it that way. But uh, that wouldn't really work for our purposes. So indivisibility is a problem with barter. Another problem is business calculation. Business firms must uh, be able to determine whether they're earning a profit or a loss, and this is impossible to do under a barter system. Now, since uh, not many people want to trade for what an individual person has an excess for, he or she must uh, find other uh, very marketable goods that they can trade with. So the log person uh, may store up on another quantity just so that uh, he can uh, use that other quantity to acquire other goods, and that's using those goods as a medium of exchange. So you may not acquire extra logs, or you may not require extra eggs or extra fish or something like that, but you would acquire these goods because you knew they were marketable to other people, and you would use those as a medium of exchange. And as people see a certain quantity or a certain commodity as a medium of exchange, and see that it is highly marketable, that is when this medium of exchange becomes money. Now, money is a huge leap forward in the history of civilization. It permitted man to overcome the obstacles of barter, and businesses could then calculate whether they were making or losing money. All goods could be priced in one commodity instead of uh, Several. Now, a number of things have been used as money over the years. I'm sure you've heard about these things. Salt, sugar, cattle, cowrie shells, 
tea, and even cigarettes in prison camps have been used uh, used as money. Now, what will be picked as money? What what are the characteristics that make a commodity a good money? And the first thing is that it be generally marketable. In other words, it has a high non-monetary demand. And that's why you can see these things throughout history had high uh, non-monetary demand, like salt, sugar, and things like that. Uh, everybody need them, everybody used them, so they were generally very marketable and they were used as money. The other thing is divisible. What makes a good money is something that can be divided into smaller units. Number three, high value per unit weight. That means it's portable. Now, cattle doesn't really fall into that category. So I think using cattle as money uh, didn't last very long um, and wouldn't be uh, particularly practical these days. A good money has to be fairly stable in value. That's number four. It should hold its uh, value over time. It should be durable, number five. Number six, it should be recognizable. Everyone should uh, recognize uh, this particular good as something um, that has value. And it should be homogeneous. It uh, should be like, uh, um, very consistent in, in, uh, in what it is. So over time, two commodities have been the most dominant to compete as money. And that's gold. And that's silver. And uh, I have some gold right here when it was money. This is a 1895 gold piece. It's uh, unfortunately we have to have put plastic around it so my grubby little hands don't, you know, ding it up or anything. But an ounce of gold in 1895 is a $20 gold piece. So this is what $20 used to look like in 1895 back when money was uh, was real money. And I don't know if that'll show up. Yeah, you can see how. No, <laughs> no. Um, I'm sorry, I'm not going to pass that around. <laughs> if my lawyer were here, I would have her follow it around and, and do that. But uh, you know where to find me. These are very, uh, very pretty coins. And you can see... See on there, it does say $20. I don't know if you can make it out very well, but that's what money used to, uh, most, what it used to be. And of course, gold and silver both were highly prized for their luster and for their ornamental value. Uh, they've always been in great demand. They're relatively scarce. They're valuable per, per weight. And they're very portable. And they're very divisible. Um, gold is virtually indestructible. You can pull it into a wire miles and miles long. Uh, very malleable, and so uh, both gold and silver, very durable and, uh, and make the perfect uh, money. So the next thing to talk about is what should the supply of money be? Now, we hear this all the time. You probably look for um, money supply figures uh, every, every week, every month to determine uh, the money supply. But uh, as Murray Rothbard wonders, economists would never ask the question, well, what should the supply of biscuits be or shoes or titanium? So even with other goods, uh, we don't worry about what the proper supply is of these goods. But uh, everybody seems to be worried about what the, uh, what the money supply is. Yet we let the market determine what the supply of biscuits is. Um, and, and so Murray asked, why shouldn't we do the same thing with money? But... Money is different than biscuits. Uh, the more biscuits we have, the better off we are. Um, the, the more uh, Chick-fil-A sandwiches they can make out of these biscuits or whatever. And um, the more plants and equipments we can make, uh, you know, to make these biscuits, that's all the better. But money is different. Uh, the more money we have, that doesn't mean we're better off. Even though money is indispensable to production, an exchange, it is simply transferred from one person's assets to another. As Mises wrote, any supply of money will be equally optimal to another. Doesn't matter what the supply of money is. 
To increase the supply of money only dilutes the purchasing power of the existing money. <laughs> so if overnight the supply of money was doubled, we wouldn't be any better off. Society would be no better off because the real resources, labor, capital, goods, natural resources, productivity, that hasn't changed. Prices overall could, would double. No one would be better off except for those who receive the money first because they would be able to spend their newfound cash prior to everyone else, take advantage of lower prices. But overall, society would be no worse off with more money. But of course, we hear day after day after day that the Federal Reserve, the Treasury, they need to create more money, they need to create lower interest rates so that we'd be better off, but it's just not true. The market's perfectly capable of deciding what the money supply should be. There's no need for it to keep up with population. There's no such thing as a proper supply of money. Now, if gold was money, the only way to create supply would be to mine more of it. And it would only be mined if it was profitable to create that money. But the other way to create money is counterfeiting. Instead of going to the trouble and expense of mining gold, you might take brass or plastic or some other uh, substance and try to pawn it off as gold. And, of course, one of the reasons gold's universal acceptance is money in the free market is it's very difficult to, to counterfeit. Its look, its sounds as a coin, very easily recognizable. Its purity can be readily tested. And I wish this wasn't wrapped in plastic. I'd drop it. Well, I probably wouldn't drop it on that machine. But you would see how heavy it was. How many have never hold, held an ounce of gold? Have you all held a? Oh, a lot of you have never held an ounce of gold? Oh, well, we may have to do that before the week's out. Because it will have a profound effect on you. <laughs> <You'll>, <laughs> you won't want it pried from your cold, dead hing- fingers, as they say. It's a, uh, it's a wonderful substance. And it's very, like I say, it makes the, uh, it makes the perfect money. So that any type of counterfeiting dilutes the value of all the existing dollars. And counterfeiting is an inflation process that injures all legitimate money holders because their purchasing power is diluted. Counterfeiting, counterfeiting defrauds and uh, injures everyone. But not everybody is harmed equally. As I said before, The counterfeiters benefit first. If you get the money first, if overnight uh, the supply of money was doubled and you had access to it first, then you could run over here to Mama Goldberg's and Chick-fil-A and use your newfound money to uh, have a run on chicken sandwiches and turkey wraps, probably driving up the price for those uh, who who didn't get their money till later in the day who would... uh, experience higher prices. Now, the, the government's supposed to apprehend counterfeiters, and they do. Believe me, if you, want to, if you want to go to jail, just get into the counterfeiting business because they don't like the competition. <laughs> and that's the point here, is that the primary counterfeiter is now uh, the government. And it was the invention of paper money that allowed government to really get into the counterfeiting business. And at this point, I have something that you've probably seen before. It's a $20 bill. What used to be $20, what $20 is today. Oops, upside down. Poor Andrew. Made the first central banks go away, and now he has to adorn a $20 bill. (laughs) Too bad. (laughs) Now, kings had long since granted themselves the monopoly on minting coins, and when the treasury would run low, What they would do when they needed to pay for wars, pay for other social programs. Oh, what do you got here? What? Oh, okay. There we go. Anybody else have anything they want to put up here? (laughs) (laughs) Presuming it has some kind of value. Anyway, kings have always uh, granted themselves a monopoly. And when they ran low, they would uh, what was known as sweat, clip, or cry coins. In other words, they would confiscate the coins and they'd shave little bits of it off and then uh, collect that money 
and uh, create um, create more coins than to um, pay for pay for their nonsense that they were engaged in. But this process was slow; didn't generate enough money as quickly. Uh, the king always needed money, so the next step was writing paper tickets, supposedly backed by gold. And governments couldn't start printing tickets. Uh, they just couldn't start printing tickets and having contractors take the tickets as money. As I said before, uh, contractors would only take uh, these uh, paper tickets if they thought that they could be exchangeable into gold and silver. And, of course, government also compels the acceptance of these paper tickets by passing legal tender laws. And that's what we have today. You have to use that $20 bill right there in... Uh, in use of exchange uh, due to uh, legal tender laws. Now, when the government inflates or counterfeits, it benefits first and foremost because it gets the money uh, the first, followed by government contractors who then receive the money. Uh, those on uh, fixed incomes or pensioners, they are the ones that are hurt the most because they receive the money last. And only when there is paper money that's been accepted for a long time is the government able to make paper, pay, uh, paper money irredeemable, cutting the link to gold. So there is nothing standing behind this $20 bill. Now, you will occasionally run into someone uh, who says there is a bunch of gold in Fort Knox standing behind that 20 And that is not true. So, But there are quite a few folks, and uh, generally older folks, that uh, that uh, believe that's true, but it's it's not. That is just backed by the full faith in government, full faith and credit of the United States government. And I'll let you decide how much that is worth. <laughs> and as Murray said, when government was able to print money that is irredeemable, he wrote, the government is now in seventh heaven. They don't have to be constricted by the amount of gold, and they can print as much as they want of, uh, you know, inflationary issues of government paper. And, of course, gold's considered, we know, from, uh, from Maynard. Uh, that's who uh, uh, Murray Rothbard used to refer to John Maynard Keynes as Maynard. Uh, uh, I, don't think, I don't think it was exactly a term of endearment. But, uh, of course... <laughs> Maynard used to say that uh, gold was a barbarous, uh, barbarous relic and uh, it was old fashioned and it was sophisticated, cool people that, uh, that dealt in uh, paper money. So, uh, and, it, and it was only nut jobs that want to use gold. Well, I, I guess I'm in that nut job category. So probably a few other people uh, in the room are as well. So we've looked at the supply of money. Uh, let's look at the demand of money. The demand for money is not talked about very often. The supply of goods and services increases in a commodity. The demand for money in exchange will also increase. An increased supply of goods produced will raise the demand for money and therefore lower overall prices. And historically, the supply of goods and services has risen um, every year. And this increase in the demand for money will tend to lower prices over a period of time. Prices fell from the mid-18th century until 1940, with the exception of war periods. And, of course, that's when the government would create, create money any way they could to, uh, to engage in war. Now, the demand for money is affected by the frequency in which people are paid, their salaries um, or wages. And the less you're paid, um, the less often you're paid, uh, the more average count, uh, balances you need to maintain. In other words, if you're only paid once a month, you need to hold on to higher cash balances to satisfy your bills over the course of that month. And if you're paid twice a month, you don't need to hold as uh, high a cash balances because you know you have another paycheck coming in between. So the less frequent the payment, the higher the cash balance, therefore the greater demand for money greater uh, the amount at any price level that a person will seek to keep in his cash balance. People on commissions or self-employed should and car do carry higher cash balances. Uh, they're paid less frequently. Uh, their payments are sometimes uncertain. 
So they should keep higher cash balances, and, and they do for those two reasons. Technological changes also affect the amount of money that you need to carry. Credit cards are an exe excellent example. If you have a credit card, your need for carrying cash is, uh, is decreased. In fact, uh, upon moving to Auburn, I found out that, you know, I can use an Auburn money clip. This is what one of those looks like. This happens to have NASCAR on it. That's pretty cool, the southern thing. And you can see it doesn't hold very much money, but I don't need much money here in Auburn because I can get what most everything I need with credit cards. I don't need to have cash either in my account or carry on. Now, this is a Vegas money clip and because uh, this is what you need in Vegas because you're carrying lots of cash. So you pick your put your roll of dollar bills or dollar bills, you know, <laughs> hundreds in here to walk around in Vegas. And uh, you can get these at actually at Piero's Restaurant, one of my favorite restaurants in uh, 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 Vegas. And uh, it is, it's an official Vegas money clip. All the uh, big time high rollers walk around town with all their money in a, in a rubber band like that. So anyway, that's the difference between uh, the amount of cash you need to carry. Um, in fact, the Japanese are thinking about outlawing cash. Don't know if you've read that. Um, they're, Japan's still mired in a depression, recession for the last 20 years, and they think that if they outlaw cash, then they'll be able to stimulate the economy. And uh, <laughs> the Japanese tend to want to carry a lot of cash. Um, I understand they typically, um, cash balances are more like 16%. Rather than two or three percent in other parts of the world, so they want to they want to outlaw it. And there's there's a reason uh, it ban money that's left in banks can then be created out of nowhere more easily. So there is something uh, something to that. Now whether they're going to be able to pull this off, who knows? But uh, that's the latest plan out of Japan that they're kicking around uh, to uh, to get out of their uh, two decade long uh, funk that they're in. So. But these technological uh, developments that economize cash will tend to cause demand for money to be reduced and prices to increase. But it's really the public's confidence in money uh, that must be strong for the demand for money to be high. Uh, the demand for paper money is always very volatile, and uh, it's driven by confidence or lack thereof, uh, while at the same time, the demand for gold and silver is uh, is always uh, very high. So it's this public expectations of future price levels that's far and away the most important determinant for the demand for money. And the demand for money rises if it is expected that prices will fall. And the demand for money will fall if the public expects prices to increase. Now that makes... When you first hear it, sometimes that doesn't make sense, but when you think about it, if people expect that prices will stay the same or the fall, they want to hold their cash balances, wait to make some purchases, not all purchases, but some purchases, while at the same time, if people believe that prices are going to increase, then you're going to want to trade your cash for the goods and services before they go up in price. So again, the demand for money rises, if it's expected that prices are going to fall, demand for money will fall if the public expects prices to increase. Deflationary price expectations mean lower prices. Inflation, inflationary price expectations mean higher prices. Expectations don't change uh, suddenly. Uh, it takes time for this to happen. And again, it is based on the record of the immediate past. These expectations are sluggish and uh, in revising themselves to, uh, to adapt to new conditions. Mises outlined the typical inflation process uh, that was based on the German hyperinflation of 1923. In phase one, prices didn't rise near as much as money supply because public was still and had deflationary expectations. So the government at this point thinks it's great. They can print all the money they want with impunity. But in phase two, instead of a rising demand for money, moderating these price increases, 
a falling demand for money will intensify price inflation. And then in phase three, prices go up faster than money supply. Then there's a shortage of money. People urge government to print more money. And if the government does this, prices and money spiral upwards. The value of money is disappearing. Even as, as I sit here and contemplate it, I must get rid of my money right away and buy anything. Matters not what, so long as it isn't money. It's kind of like my girlfriend in a shoe store. That was a funnier line than you gave it credit for, but that's fine. <laughs> uh, I was expecting the faculty to pick up the slack there, but they didn't. Uh, So the demand for money falls to virtually zero when this happens. And in the German hyperinflation, workers were paid twice a day. Housewives would stand at the gate in the factories with a wheelbarrow and the money, uh, and the money to store, and then they'd take the money in the wheelbarrow to the store and buy anything. Anything was on the shelves. Production fell. People became more interested in speculation than in working for wages. Germans began to use foreign currencies. Uh, or to barter, and the mark completely collapsed. And to illustrate this, in 1914, one mark, one German mark, equal one quarter of a dollar. That was in 1914. By October of 23, it took 25.3 billion marks <laughs> to equal a dollar. <laughs> Mo- one month later, it took 4.2 trillion marks to equal a dollar. So when you hear in the news lately uh, about worries about hyperinflation, you can just imagine in a month or in a period of years, everything that you'd saved and you thought you had a nice nest egg to live your golden years on maybe would be reduced to paying for lunch or buying a tank of gas. It is a frightening, (coughs) frightening, thought. And yet we have a Federal Reserve and a government that continues to pound the table and worry about deflation. Yet it is inflation that they're uh, creating. This was a change, this was changed by the Germans, um, and they, they changed their currency and created a, uh, Renton mark, uh, essentially, uh, one of those became one trillion marks, soaked up some of the currency. They stopped inflation, and the Germans, and, of course, you've already heard from Professor Holzman how smart the Germans are <laughs> over and over, and I'm sure you'll hear more of that. Um, but they have hyperinflation burned into their memories. Americans do not have that burned into their memories, and, uh, but they may yet uh, before this is all over. Now, I want to leave the subject of uh, money and... Uh, go to something that I know a little bit about because I was a banker, although uh, most of this banking I'm going to talk about I never engaged in. But uh, uh, we're going to talk about banking for the second half of this. And I'm going to start with loan banking. Actually, I was a loan officer, made uh, made real estate loans, till the, till that didn't work out very well. Uh, but loan banking is uh, straightforward enough. Uh, if I want to start a bank and save some money, I uh, might start a bank and I would initially loan out my own money and earn the profit from the interest that I had earned from um, from the borrower who would pay and uh, the loan would be re- repaid and you would uh, do it all over again. You may want to you may want to take in investors. You might want to sell bonds and uh, and then again you would uh, loan that money out and you would earn a profit on the difference between what you'd pay the bondholders in interest and what you would receive from from your borrowers. And um, the banker would get paid for being an expert on on where its where its loans should be made and to whom and would reap the award for for this for this service. Uh, there's no inflationary action by being a loan bank. Uh, the money's been saved, a present good has been traded for a future good, and the money has been has been lent out. So there's no, uh, there's no money being created out of nowhere in this case. If the bank makes unsound loans and goes bankrupt, uh, as in any other kind of insolvency, its shareholders and creditors would suffer the losses, and uh, that bankruptcy would be no different than 
than any other. Uh, unwise management or poor entrepreneurship would cause a harm to the owners and the creditors. Now, a uh, good, good example of straight loan companies are what I call hard money lenders, uh, finance companies, and factors. Those are all, uh, all loan bankers. And an example of a factor, uh, if you're not familiar with that, is CIT. Now, you may have heard of CIT in the, um, in the news. They are on the brink of bankruptcy. Uh, they were saved by some of their bondholders, uh, extending them another Three billion dollars, um, but I think that's only going to last them a month. But uh, again, they don't have depositors; uh, they have they have more bondholders. Hard money lenders are uh, uh, were lenders in hot real estate markets that would loan on real estate. Uh, developers who couldn't borrow from banks didn't want to borrow from banks. A hard money lender would gather a pool of saved money from investors, pool it together to make uh, real estate loans, generally at high rates of, you know, 12 percent, 15 percent. So even when prime was one and uh, we might charge uh, two or three over prime for a loan, so the bank's getting three or four, the hard money lender would be typically getting 11 or 12 for the same kind of loan. Because generally people who have actually saved the money and are, uh, foregoing, um, foregoing, foregoing consumption, they don't generally want a higher return than somebody that just has their money in the bank that is uh, FDIC insured. So uh, many of these hard lend- money lenders uh, have been devastated through the, uh, through the real estate crash, but you don't hear a lot of, about them, but I would predict that you will hear um, more and more because there's been a lot of uh, investors who've lost a lot of money investing in through hard money lenders because they didn't think real estate would ever go down in value. And they are learning that lesson uh, very quickly. So let's turn to deposit uh, banking. Legitimate deposit banking is based on, uh, in my view, honoring property rights. Um, If you... Put money in a bank, especially in a uh, demand deposit account. Um, you probably consider it your money, right? I, if you have money in the bank, do you? Uh, does anybody here, uh, if you've got a checking account, do you think you've lent the bank money? You think you have? You've lent it to them. Okay. A lot of people would, if so, on your balance sheet, would you? Um, That money, would you call it cash or would you call it loan to bank or loan receivable from bank in a demand deposit where you can pick it up anytime? Yeah, not talking about a CD in this case, but demand deposit, most people would consider their money. They can, they can go and get it anytime. Where, whereas in a CD, you have, you have lent the bank money for a certain period of time and you have a contractual obligation and, and they can, uh, do what they will with the money. Uh, but most demand deposits, if you put the money in one day, you can go back and get it the next. And so you have the expectation is, is that they're holding the bank, uh, holding that money for you. But, uh, but that's not the case. Um, and, uh, all men, uh, the, of course, this started with the goldsmith bankers, uh, a long time ago. People would, uh, put their gold with a, uh, goldsmith banker. And uh, he would hold their gold. Eventually, uh, these goldsmith bankers would say, gee, uh, I think I can print more tickets than I have gold because I don't think everybody will show up for their gold uh, all at once. And the more tickets I have out, the more money I can create and the more money I can earn. And that's what's happened. I mean, all men are subject to uh, temptation to commit theft and fraud. And uh, the warehousing profession is no different. Um, and short of just flat stealing the depositor's stuff, in this case the money, the warehouseman would borrow it mon- temporarily with the hope uh, and be able to hopefully profit by the speculation and then return it later. Of course, this is called embezzlement. Uh, embezzlement in the dictionary means appropriating and fraudulently to one's own use as money or property entrusted in one's care. And of course, nothing is more tempting than gold bullion or money. Uh, for embezzlement because gold is fully fungible. So these goldsmiths, deposit bankers, virtually always embezzled 
because it was profitable to create money out of nowhere. So over time, bankers and government have found it important to find an adequate theoretical justification uh, beyond the easy solution of simply declaring legal a corrupt criminal practice, uh, which is ultimately what happened. But what happened in 1811 uh, in Carr versus Carr was a very important court case, and that is when the court determined um, that the debts mentioned in a will uh, that it was included as cash balance in a uh, bank deposit account, the master of the rolls, Sir William Grant, ruled that it did since the money had been paid directly into the bank and was not earmarked in a sealed bag. It had become a loan rather than a bailment. Five years later, in Devane's versus Noble, uh, the same judge ruled that money paid into a banker's uh, becomes immediately a part of his general assets and his is time merely a debtor for that amount. 1848, Foley versus Hill and others, Lord Cottenham ruled money when paid into a bank ceases altogether to be the money of the principal. It is then that the money of the banker, who is bound to an equivalent by paying a similar sum to the deposited with him when he is asked for it, the money is placed in a custody of banker to do what he pe pleases. So we had this series of court cases that uh, turned deposit banks from bailment uh, and essentially um, created the legal justification for what we know as uh, fractionalized uh, banking. Now, I... Uh, um, all that, all these court cases remind me of a scene from a John Wayne movie. Uh, There's a movie called The Common Sharrows. I don't know if you've seen it, but uh, Circuit uh, Court Judge Thaddeus Jackson Breen uh, says to Paul Regret, Major here has told me about your troubles. I've been thinking it over in light of my 40 years experience in legal jurisprudence and have come to the positive conclusion that there ain't no way to do this legal and honest. But being good, sensible Texans will do it illegal and dishonest. So I think that kind of wraps up the uh, way uh, the courts have held on uh, on the deposit issue. So law has been de uh, deliberately ambiguous to legally justify fractional reserves, and uh, and this is needed because fractional reserve banking cannot survive economically on its own; it must be supported by government force in the form of a central bank, which institutes the regulations, and supplies liquidity necessary at all times to keep the apparatus going. So what we've done now is, you can see, we've, we've uh, married, if you will, the loan bank with the deposit bank. And that's when we create fractional reserves. So if you put 100 bucks in the bank, they don't have 100 bucks of your money waiting for you. They probably have lent out uh, 90 bucks of it. And they, the hope is, is that not everybody shows up to get their money all at once. And of course, when things go bad, there's rumors out that loans aren't being paid off because of the 100 bucks you put in the bank. The 90 bucks was lent to the real estate developer down the street who built some houses that he can't sell anymore, so he can't repay the loan. So people get wind of this and they want to come and get their money. And when everybody wants to show up at once and get their money, and it doesn't take everybody, if say, Five or ten percent of the people want to show up and get their money. They can't get it, so you have what's known as a run on the bank. And uh, the last time there was really uh, runs on the bank was uh, from 1929 to 1933, during the uh, the first Great Depression, and uh, we had uh, 9,200 banks fail. So we haven't had this uh, this many fail this time around, but uh, we are on our way. Uh, I'm not sure it'll be 9,200. There were many, many more banks um, back in the uh, early 30s than there are now. So, but uh, 92 of them did fail. We actually only have about 8,500 banks in total in the United States right now. And I think uh, as of last week's, uh, last Friday, seven more banks failed. I think we're up to uh, 64 or something like that. So a uh, fair number of failures now with this real estate uh, meltdown. Now, fractional reserve bankings by themselves is very constrained um, because uh, 
Uh, deposits will want to be redeemed by customers of other banks. So if you have your money in one bank, you write a check to your friend. Your friend uh, banks at another bank. That bank will uh, redeem that check for this bank. So uh, the uh, bank to stay in business will always have to maintain uh, maintain reserves to to honor those checks. Now, if everyone was uh, if everyone banked at the same bank, uh, this would not be an issue. If, uh, if I wrote a check to, uh, to Mark Thornton uh, and we both uh, banked at Auburn National Bank, um, my check would just go from my, my money would go from my account into Mark's account, stay in the same bank. There would be no redemption and all would be well. So, um, so even if there were free banking, that would not be an issue. Um, so the fewer banks you had, um, with the more customers you have, um, the more that you can inflate. But the more banks you have with the fewer number of customers, uh, the harder it is. So, um, so what was needed to have commercial banking with many banks and still have the still have the apparatus to create money, what you needed was a cartelization system. And that came in the form of the Federal Reserve, which was formed in, uh, in 19, uh, 1913. And uh, central banks, either government-owned uh, and operated or else especially privileged by the uh, central government. Of course, you'll run into plenty of people who will say that, the, uh, that our Federal Reserve is private, and um, all would be well if it was just run by the government, but uh, uh, somehow the fact that the Federal Reserve Chairman uh, testifies before Congress, uh, is appointed by the President, uh, I think would seem to tell you that the uh, central bank is there and essentially controlled by, uh, by the federal government. So um, the idea that it is, uh, is private is, uh, is a misnomer. So... So how do we uh, how do we create money in a commercial banking system? Um, hopefully this will show up. Not my eye. Not too bad. You guys in the back are going to want me to shove this up here. All right. So I wanted to pick a big strong bank to use in as an example. So I stumbled onto Citibank. You know how good a shape they're in. And uh, and first uh, first transaction we have is that the Fed buys Treasuries from Citibank, and you can see what happened. Uh, see what happens here. Uh, the uh, there was somebody named Jones that had uh, uh, deposits in Citibanks for a thousand bucks. The uh, Citibank had uh, taken Jones's deposit. They had had uh, uh, U.S. government securities of a thousand bucks. But the Fed wanted to uh, expand the money uh, supply and wanted to uh, expand. So what they did was they bought um, $1,000 worth of bonds from Citibank. And uh, so Citibank has a, essentially a demand deposit at the Federal Reserve. Federal Reserve has an asset for the government securities that they bought from, from Citibank. And now Citibank has... Uh, a thousand bucks in reserve to uh, to lend out. Now, you know, city's not just going to sit on that money. They need to find a credit worthy uh, credit worthy borrower, and you can see that they uh, find Donald Trump to uh, to borrow some money. And um, what we're assuming here is a ten uh, percent reserve. Ratio. So, of the thousand dollars that uh, uh, that city had in uh, on deposit, Jones, they lend uh, they lend ninety uh, nine hundred bucks to Trump, and uh, uh, so what it looks like now is that uh, we the assets of Citibank is a uh, a loan to Trump for nine hundred bucks. We have a uh, demand deposit still there from Jones because nothing's happened to that. The loan to Trump becomes a demand deposit to Trump. 
So that totals uh, 1900 and then the reserves are still there for a thousand bucks. So, so it, our T account balances and, uh, we've gone from, from 1900 then to, or from a thousand to 1900. Now, Donald's not a guy that sits on his money very long. He's got bills to pay and, uh, the first bill he's got to pay is to his ex-wife, Ivana, uh, but she doesn't bank at Citibank. She banks, uh, with the friends of the government over there at Goldman Sachs. And so she writes a, uh, a check to Ivana. And so now Citibank has a, uh, asset in the form of a loan to Trump for 900. They got a demand deposit to Jones for a thousand reserves, um, of a hundred. And then Goldman Sachs, our bank B in this case, has a demand deposit to Ivana for 900 bucks and reserves of, of 900 bucks. Now you can see what it looks like with the Federal Reserve. They've got, still has those, uh, U.S. government securities for a thousand. Um, they've got, uh, equity and liabilities then, uh, demand deposits with now Citibank for a hundred and Goldman Sachs for or 900. Now, Goldman needs to make a loan because now they've got some deposit money and they've found a credit worthy borrower in the state of California. And, uh, again, using our ratio of holding 10%, they lend 90% of that 900, so 0.9 times 900 equals a loan to the state of California, uh, for $810. So our balance sheets now, we have uh, Bank B, Goldman Sachs, got a loan to California, 810. They've got reserves at 900. Demand deposit, Ivana still got her money there. Uh, the state of California now has $810 uh, demand deposit, which is the other side of the loan transaction. So you can see how their, um, their balance sheet has expanded. Well, the state of California has bills to pay, and we're going to assume that they have to pay CalPERS. I don't know if you know what CalPERS is, but that's the uh, uh, government uh, employees pension fund that is uh, woefully underfunded, uh, and eventually the taxpayers are going to have to support that, but that's an, another story. So anyway, the state of California pays CalPERS. We can see what happens here. We've got Bank B, uh, Goldman Sachs. They've got a loan to California, uh, 810 bucks, uh, reserves of 90 bucks, uh, demand deposit to Ivana still. And, uh, CalPERS has their account at Wells Fargo, being a good, uh, good California, uh, company like they are. So, um, so this is kind of what we end up with, um, in this particular example. Hopefully you can see that. Oops, gotta come down a little bit. Uh, Citibank at this point has a Trump loan for 900 bucks. They got a reserve for 100, uh, demand deposit still with Jones. Good old Jones's money has been uh, working hard all this time. Goldman Sachs has a loan to uh, to California for 100 and, uh, 110 um, and uh, reserve of 90 demand deposit with uh, Ivana. She hasn't spent her money on shoes or anything else so far. Wells Fargo now has a demand deposit with CalPERS for 110 and reserves for 110. And you can see what the assets of the Fed now. Um, are now um, treasury uh, treasury securities for a thousand bucks, then demand deposits for a hundred ninety and eight ten uh, from Citibank, Goldman Sachs, and Wells Fargo, respectively. So this thousand bucks that um, that was injected by the Fed by buying that treasury over time, if we carried this example all the way out, would have increased the money supply by ten thousand dollars or by ten times. And that's the magic of uh, monetary creation uh, today. And um, I think hopefully you can understand that if any of those loans go bad, then you create the situation like really what we have today, where you have bad assets in the form of uh, collateralized debt mor- obligations, uh, mortgages, construction loans, land loans, uh, when they go bad on that side of the balance sheet, that's how banks very quickly get in trouble. And, uh, and then you, uh, have, uh, people screaming for, 
for a bailout of these banks to uh, keep them keep them in operation. The way it uh, leverages on the way up, and the loans go bad, it leverages on the way back down uh, just as quickly. So it is a highly volatile um, monetary system and could in no way, shape, or form be considered a sound monetary system. Um, just to bring this somewhat up to date, um, maybe this spring you read that the Federal Reserve had committed to buying $300 billion in long-term treasuries and, uh, and to do it directly from the Treasury. And actually, Murray Rothbard had something to write about this, and I, I kind of take the situation that he, uh, that he wrote about it and applied the current numbers, but he, he wrote essentially to the effect that if the Fed were to finance new Treasury bond issues directly, as it was only allowed by law to do for a while during World War II, this step would be highly inflationary. For the Treasury would now have an increased $300 billion, not just of newly created money, but of high-powered bank money, demand deposits at the Fed. Then as the Treasury spent the money, its claims on the Fed would filter down to the private economy, and the total bank reserves would increase by $300 billion. The banking system would then pyramid loans and deposits on top of that by 10 to 1, in our example, in the modern day example, until the money supply increase would be no less than $3 trillion. Hence, we have a highly inflationary nature of direct Fed purchases of new bonds from the Treasury. So when you hear about this in the news, you hear uh, terms like quantitative easing and uh, euphemisms like that, and they make it sound like... Uh, uh, really nothing very serious is going on. When you hear 300 billion, which I think we're all kind of getting numb to these numbers, to create three, um, three trillion dollars in money supply is a horrifying prospect. And if we think again, going back to, uh, Germany in 1923 and what can happen to a currency, that is really what's at stake here. So what we've done is, uh, we've gone from barter We've gone to this being $20, now this is $20, and who knows what it will be in the future. But essentially, uh, with fiat paper and multiple fractional reserve banking and central banking, we now have permanent inflation. Thanks.